Hi, everybody. Um, we are live. Uh, so uh, how is everybody? I hope you are well, because we are going to talk about some really fun stuff tonight. And uh, we got um, a lot of good stuff on the docket. So uh, I uh, first wanted to say, um, actually, a lot of, of uh, podcast interviews came out uh, or are coming out this week. So uh, I'm going to be later on putting a card, um, you know, or a thing in the video so that you can just click on and go to um, to those those podcast interviews. But I did one with uh, Dr. Hampton and also Nutrition with Judy. And um, and last week was the Carb Addiction Doc. Oh, and um, Prime, um, Blue, uh, Primal Blueprint. I was uh, interviewed on their podcast. So all of that happened or was released in the last couple of days. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm going to show you all about that. Um, and then uh, let's see. Uh, I don't, do we have any other announcements? Oh, my goodness. I had all this stuff prepared in my head. Now I, can't, I feel like there's something I forgot. Doesn't it always happen that way? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what do you think of the new frame? I decided to mix it up. I'm looking at it now. I like it. I like it a lot. All right. All right. Good. Good. And uh, everybody in the chat, let me know if you like it too. Um, okay. So. Um, and everyone in the chat, hit the like button. Oh, yeah. Very important. There's 11 of you right now. We need to see at least 11 likes. Appreciate that. Appreciate you all coming through. Um, did you want to ask them anything? No, you already asked them if they yeah. like them. Frame. So yeah, just uh, hit the like, subscribe, and um, and also don't forget we now have super chats and super stickers. So if you want to support uh, the the live stream, we like to provide free stuff as often as we can. So I want to keep this free, and um, you know we just need a little help to keep that uh, going. Oh, Melvina likes the frame. I love it. Okay, nice. awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it is so lovely to see you all. So uh, today we are talking about the most common questions that people ask us, uh, you know, when they hear that we are carnivore, the things that are surprising and stuff. Um, and I wonder if, Arian, if you got the joke, you know, I put, I don't know if anybody saw my Instagram reel and the song that I put with it. Oh, no, I've barely been on Instagram today. I missed it. Do you remember OPP? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> the so don't sing it because uh, you know we don't want to get uh, demonetized. But um, right. I right. But I I um, you know put in the description the the single most common question I ask, and we're, this is number one. So we're going to dive right into it. Number one is what's your poop like? So mm. I wrote what is OPP as in other people's yeah uh, so, and I just got it <laughs> yeah yeah so I don't know if you guys got it if it was too if that was like too deep or what <laughs> um okay well regardless they get it now <laughs> yeah 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 and it is definitely a thing that comes up mm hmm yeah so uh, <laughs> So let's get right into that. You know, I'm not used to having people. Um, <laughs> I'm not used to. Seamless is asking why I have these band aids on. Oh, my ex left <laughs> flared up, and um, yeah, oh, no. I just need to have it on. And I couldn't find regular band aids at the grocery store, so they have these kids ones that are neon. Yeah. <laughs> but like, what can I do? What can I do? Oh. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Oh, Kim saw my um, saw my Instagram reels today. Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah. So I'm not used to having people ask me, you know, such personal questions. But um, you know, I think it, it 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 bears commenting on because so many people do have questions on it. So do you get that question a lot, Arian? Um, I actually, so for me, it doesn't come as a question. It comes as a statement. Like they are predicting to me, um, like, oh, you're going to be pooping bricks. And they, they say it in this way. Like, I don't know why you're doing that to yourself. 
or this all-knowing kind of derisive like man you eating all that meat you're gonna have a hard time in the bathroom and so yeah it's never a question it's always a like actually pretty dismissive statement like i would appreciate a question more i think yeah um well yeah maybe that's just how guys are with one another i don't know <laughs> or well, do women say that to you oh it's women too wow okay yeah that's uh that's a shame um <laughs> yeah yeah so uh well i i don't find that people say that to me i think people are a little bit more respectful with me but um but still, it's kind of like, do you have a problem? How long have you been suffering from constipation? Uh, you know, I couldn't live right. like that because I would never go to the bathroom. And I actually am surprised at how many people who have shared with me that they have ended up in the hospital because they were so constipated. Um, not on carnivore, but just like generally speaking in life. And so, like, it's a real challenge for them. A lot of people are on... Um, uh oh god what's the word um laxatives of some kind yeah or schools stool softeners and mm -hmm. uh you know and i'm kind of surprised so on the one hand it's kind of like uh, i you know like going to the hospital for constipation is a big deal like i don't want to you know make things worse for you but you know what you're doing now isn't working <laughs> I mean, if you're already going and to the hospital. You know what? I will also see people, um, like we've got digestion so backwards that folks will take a laxative or like not a laxative. They'll take a, a stool softener and fiber at the same time and not realize that the two are counteracting each other. Oh, yeah. 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 Like we've just we've got the game all wrong. And that is one of the places like we keep thinking that there's a, a ton of things that we can do to our body and we're going to get our poop right. 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 And it's, it's by adding stuff. Yeah. So, right. And so, um, you know, taking something to, you know, make you regular is not, uh, <clears throat> You know that's not ideal in the long run so we we really do want to get away from uh, you know relying on outside substances to you know to keep us uh keep us going but um and w you know do you get a lot of questions about whether you're regular do you define regular for people or or what uh in actually in the conversations i have um they don't ask me if I'm regular, it ends up coming up again with the, the statement of fact. So like they're, they're saying it in a way that says, oh, I know you have X, Y, Z or you will. So then my, my rebuttal to that is no, actually I'm fine. And well, I guess we'll get into it for me. I still go every day. A lot of carnivores don't. Um, but uh, that's just me. I still go every day and unless I have eaten eaten something stupid in the last like usually like 24 to 48 hours, I'm fine. But yeah, they're like they assume that I'm having some issue and mm -hmm. that that issue is um extending to like the regularity and I guess like having trouble moving my bowels and I'm like no, that's actually not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I see Chase asks, what exactly is regular while in carnivore? And, uh, you know, great question. Um, that's, you know, I think that that's up to for debate. And, um, you know, I, I mean, for me, like the, the ideal is if you don't feel like you need to go or you don't have difficulty going when you, when you feel the need, then that's regular and that's fine. Whether that's, you know, every day um, or a couple of times a week or even once a week, depending on how much you're eating and what you're doing. So, you know, as long as those, you know, as long as there's not any pain or discomfort or, a, you know, a feeling like you need to go and you can't then there's not a problem. Yeah. What I can say is um, 
a lot of carnivores seem to go less often than when they were sad and that scares some people they'll go days without um without using the bathroom without pooping and they're like terrified like oh what's going on because they're just used to pooping every day and it's because within sad you were eating a bunch of undigestible stuff especially like if you were like vegan or something like all that cellulose that you all that fiber um that you can't process in any way mm-hmm. and um <clears throat> i find that on carnivore anywhere from like you said if there's no pain and you're not feeling uncomfortable in some other way, you're fine. I think on average though, it feels like people are going anywhere really from like once a day to like once every few days or even several days. And that's still perfectly okay. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, I think that you should feel comfortable and, um, you know, if the, well, as Seabliss is saying, if the volume is much less, you know, mm-hmm. don't worry about it. You're eating a lot less food and there's just a lot less waste. Yeah. Your body actually uses all or most of what you eat when you're eating meat. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot less waste to excrete. Yeah. And I think that there's this idea of thinking about our intestines and our, uh, you know, colon as kind of like this long, windy tube that needs to be cleaned out by, you know, like in a mechanical way where something Mm -hmm. comes and washes off the surface and scrubs it and removes anything that's sticking to it. But like that is the absolute wrong way to look at our gut and and the way it cleanses itself or, or just generally operates. And so any you know, any method like that is going to be way more damaging and harmful than beneficial. So, you know, so thinking about fiber as a way to kind of push stool through is like just the worst possible thing to to do because it doesn't do that. It just gets stopped up and, and blocks things. You get diverticulitis, which is, you know, pockets of intestine where, um, it sort of creates a pouch uh, and, and things get stuck in it and can sometimes yeah. get infected. And you can have like, you know, a flare up where you have an infection that, um, you know, causes people to be hospitalized for weeks. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a very serious condition. And, um, you know, and it's it's made worse by these types of foods. But when you remove them and allow the bacteria to, you know, process and clean as it normally would, it's, it's not a problem, but that we don't allow that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just the idea that you need to like help your system along as opposed to just letting it do what it normally does. Like, yeah, fiber is unnecessary and yeah, causes divert diverticulitis. It's actually an irritant to the gut. Yeah. So did you, I mean, you were like dealing with this in terms of your IBS. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, what did they tell you uh, about how to handle your your gut and to make it, you know, make it better versus um, what you found to be true? So I assume by they, you mean the doctors. Um, Yeah. Yeah. They. Well, I don't know. They. I mean, we walk around talking about they. They say, (laughs) you know, you tell me who is they. Right. Well, actually, yeah. So then they includes the Internet, too. And when I was looking up IBS, all I found was the FODMAP diet, um, which just cuts out like every almost everything you can think of to eat. Um. And some of those made sense and some of them really didn't make sense. It's like all these things that it's like, I forget what FODMAP stands for. I think the F is, no, don't even start me to lie. I don't remember what any of the letters are. It's this huge diet. You're supposed to not eat anything that's on this diet. And then you slowly reintroduce things to, um, well, you don't eat anything that's on the list. And then you um, should feel relief and then you can reintroduce things and you'll feel better, hopefully continue to feel better, or you'll introduce something 
you realize that that thing still hurts you, your symptoms come back, and now you know, I can't eat that thing. For how long? I don't know. I guess the rest of your life? Like, <laughs> the the uh, advice was so horrible. Um because it was vague and it wasn't, it didn't point to like any root cause of a problem. Like all I knew is I just woke up one day and started having IBS, had no idea why. And the doctors don't, they didn't have any explanation. Nobody else had any explanation of like how that could have happened. I've kind of pieced it together, at least pieced together a theory over time, but like they had no clue. Um, so yeah, that was the, that was the advice. Um, in terms of what actually solved it, I think it's, I was doing too many things at once. So I don't know which thing was the linchpin, but I stopped drinking so much water so I could produce more stomach acid because I wasn't flushing out my electrolytes. Um, I was taking a stomach acid supplement, HCL with pepsin. So there was that too. And I very much calmed down the amount of alcohol I was drinking. And there's a fourth thing. Oh, and just, I did kind of follow the FODMAP diet. So I cut out a lot of things I was eating, pretty much everything. So like in that interview, I say that, um, well, the interview that uh, you and I did, I think I said that there was one day, like Memorial Day was coming up and I basically just ate meat and bread. Mm -hmm. or meat bread cheese mm -hmm. and it was light on the bread yeah well yeah and so you started to see some improvement and you just kept rolling with it right and rolled right into carnivore exactly yeah i i realized that oh that didn't hurt so much maybe i can focus on meat and i realized that that wasn't on the list of things that i can't eat on the fodmap diet yeah yeah. You know, I felt like in my early 20s, I had a lot of just stomach digestive problems, too. And, um, you know, it calmed down as I got older, although I think partly that was also because I the first time I went low carb, I mean, that was like the first thing I noticed. It was like, wow, you know, I never have a stomach problem. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, years as years went by and I continue to kind of do it, I um you know, I, that was something that got a lot better for me. And, uh, you know, I, I, I feel, you know, terrible for people who go through that all the time because it sucks. I hate it. Like ruins all kinds of events and, you know, tender moments and whatever. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very not good. Okay, Chase says FODMAP stands for fermentable oleg oligosaccharides, uh, diasaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols, which are short-chain carbohydrate sugars. How did you not remember that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, so easy. It, what's funny is, as you were reading that, I looked up the diet just to make sure that I didn't lie about any part of it, and the first thing I realized is all of these are saccharides. These are mm -hmm. all carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So you could have just told me, don't eat no carbohydrates. <laughs> Why yeah. didn't they just tell me that? Yeah. Instead no of plan. listing, like, oh, they literally, it was like a list of 150 things. Mm -hmm. Who can follow that? Yeah. They could have just said no carbs. Oh, okay, cool. Like, well, I had looked at before, looked at, um, uh, you know, having systemic yeast. And so it's like a similar thing where they give you this whole long list of stuff that you, you want to avoid if you're trying to starve yeast. But, mm -hmm. you know, they could have just said a low carb diet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, systemic yeast, is that like a um, candida overgrowth? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yep. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I I dealt with that at one point. I had like the uh, the Thrush. rough patch on my lip. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Um, which apparently is candida a lot of times, and yeah, it's, it's just low carb diet solves it. Oh, yeah. Well, I had uh, problems with uh, yeast infections, and then I went carnivore, and I haven't had one since. So I still have some prescriptions, you know, for. Um, 
the stuff that you take and uh you know it's still up there in my medicine cabinet mm. and it's like wow so many things just like boom just stop never yeah. having to get those prescriptions again never buying that over-the-counter stuff again and that stuff is expensive it is not cheap so that was a significant amount of money yeah and so um people complain about a carnivore diet being expensive it's like think about all that stuff you're not buying anymore right Yes. Yeah. Like not buying any prescriptions. I think I, I don't have all the pills I have are old stuff. Um, I think mm -hmm. the one thing I bought recently, and this is the first bit of medicine that I bought in probably a year or two was um, some Afrin for uh, my sinuses to open my sinuses up. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like I'm causing that myself somehow. So I may have to go back to experimenting with no heavy whipping cream. Oh, so, so you're still having the sinus problems and still having the, um, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah, been worse probably. in like the last two weeks. So I feel like it could be that. I think so. Why, why the hesitation? Uh, well, because it could also be the change in air quality just from the weather changing. Um, I don't think it's me running my HVAC because I'm pretty much not running it. Um, but yeah, like I need to try for the next few days to, um, but, but to answer your question, that's why. There are other variables involved. And uh -huh. no, no seedless, I'm not chugging <laughs> heavy whipping cream. <laughs> Although I have done that on occasion. Not chug, I took a sip of it, but because it's, it's good. It just tastes good. Well, you know, you're all asking why I am flaring up again. So um, Friday night, I had... Um, I ordered barbecue, uh, smoked uh, brisket, and uh, smoked pork belly again. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's good. So I knew that, you know, I'd be suffering and yeah, I'm paying the, paying the price. I get it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, and I took, I even, I did take some Benadryl this morning because it was, I was really itching a lot. So there you go. Hey, over here on the black carnivore, you, you fly with us through all the clouds. You're riding with us, um, through the peaks and valleys. Like we screw up, we make decisions that may not be the smartest things we've ever decided to do and we tell you about them yes That's the I, I have always been honest here. i've always been honest um you know when i didn't join you on the caffeine, caffeine, <laughs> caffeine right? i was honest <laughs> i was sorry but i was honest <laughs> so yeah um we we do share uh here but I see Melissa's asking what's wrong with that order. So, you know, nothing for most people, nothing. But, you know, I gave up spices uh, and caffeine to try to really deal with my skin issues. And I did actually find a, um, a pretty significant improvement. So I think spices is an issue for me. And then perhaps also, um, you know, there might be an issue of... Um, uh, you know, histamines because, you know, smoking food has it cooking for a long time. I don't know. It could be that. And then pork, I think I'm okay with fresh pork, mm -hmm. not too much of it. But um, so, you know, but I, I think I have always reacted to the pork belly. I, again, I don't know why. Um, so, you know, I just, I, it, I seem to do better when it's just fresh meat and salt and nothing else. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to continue to do that. And, um, you know, and I'm happy um, with the, the progress I've been making. So this is just, you know, <laughs> a minor setback. 
Um, but I'm, you know, back, uh, back at it and, um, you know, I'll be fine. And, um, I did a little fasting yesterday and, um, you know, and I, uh, I guess I did 20, 20 hours today, maybe. And I'm going to try to keep going, um, until tomorrow. I'm, I'm really trying to get into one meal a day. So that's the goal. Um, yeah. And, uh, I was, you know, I did, it was a dry fast yesterday, but I've been so thirsty since then. So I don't know. <laughs> I might need to wait before I try the dry fasting again. Um, and I see, um, uh, um is asking about the keto rash coming into carnivore. Yeah. Some people get that. I, that's not what I'm having, but, um, I definitely have heard people talking about that. Um, you know, and I think it has to do with, uh, they say, uh, maybe oxalates or excess ketones. So usually the, um, solution is to eat a little bit more, um, carbs, just a little bit to slow down the production of ketones. And then it seems to go away. I also have read about, um, to, I guess this will be the candida show um, to bring that up again, that you can have a die off if you suddenly stop eating um, sugar and that die off can manifest into a rash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Denise says she ordered smoked brisket and smoked wings and it immediately, immediately tore up her stomach. Hmm. Yeah. I feel like that's kind of different. Because for you, it doesn't hurt your stomach. It just, um, you feel it afterwards, like throughout your body, right? Yeah, yeah. That sounds to me, hmm, smoked brisket and smoked, smoked wings and they tore up your stomach. I mean, I would ask the question, how much are you having? Is it very fatty? You know, what <laughs> else did you eat that day? But, um, but you know, if it's upset your stomach and upset your stomach. I mean, that's a pretty firm and clear no. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> so, definitely. Yeah, you have to abide by it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I wonder, I feel like pretty rarely does a thing taste really good in the moment and but still like completely beat me up later on. Well, cheese, and, heavy whipping cream. Well, okay, I mean, like, in a digestive way, beat me up. Oh. Like, normally, I feel like my, my mouth and tongue, if given the chance, will tell me, okay, stop doing that. And either I ignore that signal, or I'm eating so fast that that signal doesn't get a chance to come until I've already ingested all the thing. And then it's like, oh, well, you're going to have a bad time, because we tried to tell you, but you were going way too fast. You were speeding down that plate, and you're going to pay for it. Right, right. I, you know, I was totally that way with dairy because I used to get, you know, my stomach get upset when I ate too much of it. And so, you know, bite by bite, I would sort of check in with my tongue and my stomach. And it was very clear, you know, I might even have something in my mouth and my stomach's like, nope, we, we hit our limit. And so mm -hmm. I just have to spit it out. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. somebody, in, um, Tibla said in the chat, we really don't know what's in the food that we eat out. And yeah, that's totally true. I... Mm -hmm ate out this weekend and I had meatloaf and I was oh my god hoping. meatloaf always has breadcrumbs in it I know I know oh that now god. I was what not thinking uh, oh no uh, okay. I was not thinking yeah um, and you know what it was like sausage stuffed meatloaf it just sounded really good and it was on special that does restaurant. sound really good. Sausage, sausage stuffed meatloaf. Yeah, and it, it ended up being disappointing. It was just all, everything yeah. about it was bad. Yeah. That sounds like a great idea, though. I think I might try that. I have some sausage here, and I have some meat. Oh, I would love to. Yeah, I should do that. Just buy some bulk sausage, and I don't know, form it into something, and then wrap the meatloaf around it. The meatloaf oh, without alternates. I was imagining the links wrapped inside the meatloaf. But I don't well, know. See, that'd be cool, too. I feel like I want bulk sausage. 
But this was sausage links, and they would have been good, except they they weren't spiced well. It was just kind of like plain sausage in a link, and that's not it's not exciting. Um, Denise says she thinks it's gut itch issues. She fasted a bit, and it was her first meal in the afternoon. It used to happen when she fasted more with keto. Uh, yeah, so if you know, for me, fasting if I even you know, even coming up on the 20th hour, my stomach is like real iffy about what that next meal can be. So, um, yeah, that alone could have been the problem. Yeah. I've heard of more than a few people now say that after fasting, you got to be careful. Yeah. I mean, I wish it weren't so, cause I see all these people are like, Oh, I'm fasting all week to fit into my dress. Then I'm going to go to this party and I'll eat there. And, and I think, Oh man, that's just going to be a mess. But, you know, I never hear back from the people, so I don't know. It's, it seems well, like, yeah, it went off without a hitch. She got how in, many... she fit in her dress, and she ate at the party, and it was fine. How many people are going to tell, tell you, though, or, like, post on Instagram, so, well, I fit into the dress, and I had diarrhea that night and the whole <laughs> next day. <laughs> it was horrible. It was explosive. Oh, I'm in pain. Somebody send help. Like, <laughs> no one's going to do that. Well, you know, I so I don't know, though. But that that's what happens. Mm -hmm. That's what they say all the time. And so it's not, you know, we're not getting the kind of... Um, you know, information that we need in order to, you know, to make good choices. <laughs> so people make it sound like it's no big deal. It's, it's right. fine. Right. And it's just not. On Instagram, everyone triumphs, apparently. Yeah. 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 So, and I don't know if it's something you eventually get used to or what, but I, I've never gotten used to it, it every time. Um, and then I, it's also hard for me to go slow, you know, I just want to eat everything. So, you know, instead of having like a sip of broth and then waiting an hour and having like a bite of this and waiting an hour and, you know, a little bit more of that, like, I'm just want to dive right in. And then that's where the problem lays. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So we should go on to the next point. And right. I think we talked about, you know, going to the bathroom enough. Um, do, do you all feel like we've touched on this topic enough? Because I, <laughs> I feel like, you know. People, I think we're done. People really, yeah, we're done. We're done. We're done with poop. Let's let's wipe this. Uh, this <laughs> um, so. Uh, oh, I hate the, you and love you at the same time. <laughs> So, uh, you know, in, 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 since we were talking about this concept of, you know, people thinking of our intestines like a tube that we need to clean everything out of and flush out of, um, mm -hmm. let's go on to um, the other question that I get, which is uh, often I get, um, you know, won't you clog your arteries or I thought you cared about your health. So... <laughs> You know, yeah. figuring out how to answer that, you know, I think that the question about, you know, won't you clog your arteries, you know, kind of comes back to the same concept as, as um, you know, the intestines where, you know, your blood vessels are, you're eating stuff. And as you're eating it, like the fat just is floating through your blood and getting sludged and caught up in vessels, blood vessels. Mm -hmm. But that's not exactly what's happening. So, um, you know, from, from my understanding of like the research that's coming out, we, heart disease has a lot to do with inflammation and the cholesterol is, um, that is raised when there's a problem. Um, it's, it's raised not because there is, um, you know, not for, for a random reason, but it's going to, uh, aid a, a particular problem, you know, creating, um, dealing with the, the um, whatever is going on with the inflammation and then the plaque that's laid down as part of that, the repair process of, you know, from that inflammation. And so the, uh, the clogging that is happening is happening because there is a problem already. It's not, 
you know, the clog or the, the, the repairs are not the problem. It's something else, <clears throat> something else that's going on underneath. So that's like my super sophisticated sciencey explanation. So if you couldn't follow that, you know, <laughs> no worries. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the most important thing I try to explain to people is that, um, well, I, you know, it's really hard, especially when people are very tied to this notion of cholesterol and, um, and arteries. And, you know, and I think a lot of times people don't know what, what it is, what is the concern? You know, they just say, you know, my cholesterol, oh, you know, I, I can't eat that, right. my cholesterol. But it's like, you know, what do you think is that is, or what, what do you think is the problem? And so there's a lot to unpack there, but you know, we kind of need to do it. Um, we're coming up on, you know, the holiday season. Um, right now it's Halloween and next it's Thanksgiving. So we'll be starting to have these conversations soon. Um, so it's good to start, you know, start getting uh, ready for it. Yeah. Um, the whole cholesterol thing, it, it sucks because you're just told high cholesterol is a problem. It causes heart disease. And they don't, they don't explain that. They don't dig into it. And honestly, it's a huge topic to, to dig into. Like, people have made it their entire field of study just to study cholesterol and heart disease. Um, the short version is cholesterol is only a proxy marker for actual heart disease. Um, and it's a bad proxy. It doesn't, a high cholesterol doesn't prove anything. So your cholesterol is high. Like uh, Romia in the chat is saying that uh, hers ended up really high, 282, and her doctor, 282 total, LDL is 198. The doctor is telling her to take a statin and to eat vegan. Um, and she rightfully refused because, yes, eating, God, first of all, never take a statin. Um, but eating vegan is not going to help your cholesterol at all. And two, like your cholesterol well, isn't a it thing might that help needs. the number, but it doesn't doesn't necessarily help you. Right. It's it's not a thing that you want to help because the cholesterol isn't a problem. If the doctor's actually worried about you and heart disease, they need to get a coronary artery, um coronary artery calcium scan. Mm -hmm. Get get that. And see what that is and then keep eating carnivore wait like three months six months and whatever and get it again and see what your number is there and as long as you're trending in the correct direction then you're doing good but your total cholesterol will be higher on carnivore or on keto um because your yeah. you know cholesterol is a vehicle to bring fat around to different places so if you're running on fat for energy, it's just going to be higher because, you know, we have a lot of energy that's moving from place to place. Yeah. So and, that, uh -huh. and your cholesterol is going to be higher because um, you're you're healing at that time. Chances are you've been sad for a long time. You haven't been doing your body any kindness as far as your diet. And that cholesterol is a part of your immune response. It's needed. So mm -hmm. it's going to be floating around, transporting fat to places that need that fat because your body has probably been wanting that fat for a long time and it's just now getting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and Miss M has a, a great point. The cholesterol varies throughout the day. If you were 14 hours fasted before the test, it would have been different. So yeah. I always tell people, go to Dave Feldman's website. He has been doing a ton of research on cholesterol tests uh, and and basically has found that the, the results of them vary wildly, just as Miss M says, uh, depending on how much you ate. If you had a cup of coffee, even if you had nothing else to eat that morning, that would, you know, that could drive your cholesterol up 100 points. So um, he has developed a protocol that you can follow for three days before to help you um, reduce your your cholesterol number if you know there are people who you know for whatever reason their insurance requires it um 
if their their uh, cholesterol is a certain rate, they have to take a statin um, or they're penalized and so on. So he created this protocol that can help you drop your your cholesterol by 100, 150 points by just following it. So I really encourage you to go look at it and don't just you know decide to fast. Just go look at the protocol because it, there are some specific things that you have to do and fasting right before will drive it up. So that's the opposite mm-hmm. of what you want to do. So go and look at the protocol. Google the um, Dave Feldman cholesterol, and it should come up. Um, yeah. He's been doing this stuff for ages, and he is really fascinating. Um, you know, got a lot of great research up there about cholesterol, and it and it's you know better information than me and Ariad can give you. I think. I- yeah, like he's one of the people, he's actually exactly who I was thinking about when I said people make this their whole, like they study this just by itself. Um, I would also say it's very possible that you're one of those, um, I forget what they're called, but they're like high responders or something. Like some people um, go keto or carnivore and their cholesterol mm-hmm. does go up. And um, Dave Feldman talks about that. It's his belief that it's not a problem and he is way more learned about cholesterol than I am and that most people are. Also, though, your doctor is just saying, oh, your cholesterol is high. If the doctor isn't looking at your um, your HDL to triglyceride uh, ratio, then they are way behind the times on lipid science. And that's what you really need to be looking at. Like if we're worried about um, we're worried about heart disease. Just looking at an LDL number really doesn't tell us anything. We've learned, we've since we figured out there's LDL and HDL, or since really since we figured out that there's a such thing as cholesterol, we divided that into HDL and LDL, and then we divided LDL into like very low density and I forget what the other one's called, but it's a higher density. And you really want to know what that higher density one is, because that is apparently the problem. And I'm sure at some point we'll find out that there are multiple kinds of that and that one of them is the worst. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess it's just going to keep going forever. I don't know. But what you really care about is your LDL to triglyceride ratio. Or is it, no, your HDL to triglyceride. You want a high number for HDL. You want a low number for triglycerides. And if that's happening, and especially if that's getting better, then you're headed in the right direction. Right. The total cholesterol number, the total LDL number is, I'm going to say it's pretty much useless because I want to be safe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I find the satin thing to be pretty scary. And I was talking to this other guy who's gotten into low carb, not because he was sick, but his father was, um, you know, prescribed statins. And they got his cholesterol down to 29, which mm. is crazy. Like, that's not even a number you hear associated with cholesterol. And um, it ultimately caused his demise. But um, it caused a lot of, like, emotional brain problems because, it were, you know, remember, our brains are fat and they consume fat. And um, when we deny our brains the energy source, then, you know, the, they, the brain gets all these different kinds of problems. And so, you know, by bringing down the cholesterol, it meant there wasn't, you know, an, enough vehicles driving fat around the body and including the brain. So that's what ended up happening. And so, you know, he was determined to not have anything like that happen again and um, to anyone else. So that's why he's, you know, out here pushing people to, um, you know, try a ketogenic diet. Yeah. Um, yeah, statins. I don't remember the book, but there is a there's some book about um, how statins are horrible. Actually, there's probably multiple books. But yeah, I, I would yeah. never encourage anybody to take one of those. And if I found out somebody was taking one, I would try to talk to them about how we can get them off the statin as soon as possible. Yeah. So Romeo says um, those were. Uh, well, her HDL is 73 and her triglycerides are 53. That's excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm not your doctor, but I don't feel like you have much to worry about. Yeah. I think mine were 53, and I, when I went carnivore, they dropped to 43. Um, 
and my HDL was around 100 and my LDL was around 200. So I ended up with high blood pressure, but mm -hmm. yeah, my, so my doctor was kind of like, you know, the books say I should prescribe you a statin, but these other numbers look good. So what do you want to do? Right. So it's like, okay, nothing. <laughs> yeah. Actually, let's not do that. <clears throat> yeah. Let's not, let's not put anything on me or yeah. in me. Um, yeah. The other thing about the health is, um, so the question that I got all the time was, oh, your blood pressure is horrible from all that fat that you're eating. It's got to be. Yeah. And that was lovely. It was a really perfect, like, because I had it ready. So I give blood on a regular basis. I think you're allowed to do it like once every two months. And I pretty much hit that schedule. So every wow, time. Why? Um, my. So I grew up seeing my parents give blood on a regular basis. So it was just a normal thing. And then um, so then I become an adult and my job has like just blood drives every once in a while. And then I decided cool. to go from there to just doing it on my own, like outside of the blood drive. And then my job now, I actually get time off if I give blood. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah, nice. so that's perfect. My my but, mom was so sick and she used a lot of plasma. I also blood, but really a lot of plasma. So mm -hmm. I went to um, you know, try to to donate plasma and um and then it's such a complicated process and they don't do it in New York City. Uh, like the closest place is somewhere out in New Jersey. And I was like, are, really? are you kidding? Do you not need plasma? Like why, why are you denying my offer? So yeah, I never donated. How long ago was that? This was in uh, March. February. Oh wow. Yeah. Cause huh, they, have, they can do plasma here. But that's Red yeah. Cross. Maybe it's different if you're trying to do it like at a hospital for a specific person or something. I, I call the Red Cross. Really? You know, I was like, I'm, you know, you tell me where it is, where I should go. But yeah, like the closest place is like New Jersey. That's so I weird. I know. Yeah. It's weird. I'm like, I mean, why would you collect it in the place where there's less people? <laughs> like, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um. Yeah. The plasma giving process is. It's a lot. Like a normal blood donation takes like, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. Plasma takes like two hours. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's a, a needle in both arms because they're, they're taking the plasma and then returning the rest of the blood to you. So both arms are uh, stabilized. You can't move. If you move your arms, then the needle's going to be poking the inside of your artery and it's going to hurt like hell. Uh. Yeah. Um, I think I gave, I did plasma or platelets, or maybe I'm thinking of platelets, but I'm pretty sure plasma is like that too. Um, yeah, it's not fun. Or no, what, I actually, I meant platelets. Okay. That's what she used all the time, platelets, not plasma. Yeah. So, well, in, in any event, yeah. Not there fun. You go. So you give blood a lot. But, and what was the point of the story that you give right. blood? Right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> My bad. So, um... Because I give blood a lot, in the process of giving blood, they're going to test your, they test your iron level, your pulse, your blood pressure, all this stuff, because they want to make sure that you're healthy enough to give blood and that your blood's going to be, I guess, uh, no, that's a test they do after. They test you for like STDs and hepatitis and stuff. Yeah. Um, so I get my blood test, I get my blood pressure tested all the time. So as soon as um, this person said this, she was like, and you, you, you got to go to a doctor soon because I was keto at the time. She's like, you're, you're eating a ton of meat and that can't be good for you. Like your blood pressure is probably all out of whack and stuff. And I go, actually, no. Um, I just gave blood like maybe two weeks ago and blood pressure was a smooth like 120 over 77. Nice. And it's actually lower now because I just uh -huh. recently gave blood like last week. Um, the top number is still the same, but the systolic, I think it's the bottom number. It's like 66 or it was that time. Wow. Yeah. Excellent. Good for you. Bravo. Bravo, rather. Excellent. So, 
yeah, uh, people will question blood pressure. There's just they're going to have all these questions based on the myths that they've been told about what meat does to the body. They're going to say, oh, your poop's probably crazy. You got all kinds of meat just rotten in your intestines. No, not true. Your blood pressure's crazy. No, not true. Meat's actually making it better. Um, yeah. Your arteries are horrible. You're going to have heart disease. No, not true. It's actually the carbs that you're eating, all the insulin that they're causing, all the inflammation that they're causing, that's what's hurting your heart. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and they lay the other foods blameless. I mean, you know, someone sees you eating a cookie or a bowl of cereal and they don't say, oh, my God, your arteries are going to be clogged and you're going to be so sick. They mm -hmm. don't say that. But really, that's the stuff that's actually doing it. The carbohydrates yeah. is what's doing it. Right. The only thing this is how screwed up we are in our uh, health education. The only chronic disease that we even point to and we'll say at least a decent number of people will say that sugar is going to cause this is diabetes there are some people who don't even realize that and they think diabetes is caused by eating meat oh, yeah you know i've heard that like there's a thing going around now that keto causes insulin resistance oh. it's like oh are you kidding are you kidding mm. <laughs> yeah but yeah, yeah they um they have no idea about all the diseases that all that sugar they're eating causes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People will eat sugar and point at you and say, you need to eat healthier. And they'll say, yeah, I should probably stop the cookies because I don't want to get fat. But you with that steak is the one who's going to die. Yeah. But, you know, we're all going to die. And, um, you know, I'm aiming to make it as far from now and as quick and easy and painless as possible. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think I found the right way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so next question we get all the time is, um, don't you get bored? So do you get bored eating only meat? Uh, never. Not not a once, not never, not nan time have I just woken up like, oh, I got to eat meat again. I don't want any meat. That never happens. Literally never happens. Yeah. Now, some people say in the beginning of carnivore, they go through a period where they're like dying to, um, you know, to have... Uh, something different and just can't bring themselves to eat meat but that didn't happen to me did that happen to you i mean are we talking about like so i feel like people confuse carb cravings with being bored now i've definitely had carb cravings yeah i still yeah. have them sometimes but, yeah well um, some people say like they just can't eat another bite of meat and so everyone says, well, just don't eat anything until you want to eat again. And then you will. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've had that. Like, I've had times where I expect myself to, like, get hungry more than I am actually getting hungry. Or, like, mm -hmm. at a certain time, I'm used to being hungry. And then the next day, and it's, mm -hmm. it's that time, it's like 10 o'clock, and I'm like, I don't want to eat anything. So, yeah, if I tried to force myself to eat, I'd feel bored because mm -hmm. I don't want to eat. Yeah, I've had that. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's that um, or, you know, some people have that feeling. But, like, you know, for me, like, as long as I'm eating food that I like, I, you know, I like it. It's it's going to be good anytime I get it. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't need to be different from this morning or last week. You know, if I liked it then, I'll like it today and I'll like it tomorrow. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't get bored. Yeah, I get bored with specific things sometimes. Um, normally, it's because that thing is too low fat. Either uh, two things, either it's too low fat or I overcooked it. Those are the two times I get bored with a specific meal that I'm having. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like right now, I think I, I might have said earlier or on the last live or something like there's still that same brisket I've been complaining about. It's still in the fridge. There's not enough fat on it. So, well, I mean, I had the trouble. What, what are you going to do about it? I'm just eating it slowly. 
so today I didn't eat any. Um, I had I made um, uh, if you have the chance, this isn't just you a day. I'm sure you've had it before, but just everyone in chat. If you have the chance to get Wagyu beef. Doesn't matter if it's ground beef or just a steak or something. I just had ground beef because that's all they had at Sam's Club. It's so good. It makes the best hamburgers. Wow. And then um, I took the, so I cooked them in a pan and then I took the, like, just tipped the pan over and poured all the fat onto the burgers. Uh-huh. And I was like breaking pieces of the burgers and running it around the plate in the pool of fat with my fork. <laughs> Oh, it's so good. But yeah, like I I'm putting fat with the brisket to make it more palatable because it's uh-huh. just too dry, too lean. Yeah. But other than those kinds of situations, like, oh, I cooked the mess out of this or this is really lean. I wish there was something else with it. And then I'll just I'll put like fat trimmings or something with it. Um, yeah, I don't get bored. I don't I don't know what this board with meat thing is. I don't understand these people. I feel like some part of their brain isn't working. I mean, I think, yeah, like you said, if you're still having carb cravings, then you can get bored feeling like you don't have ketchup or, you know, like barbecue sauce or, you know, stuff like that. But once, you know, and if that's the case, then you really got to get rid of those cravings and just get those foods out. But once you do, you know, you're, you're not gonna. And I liked what Seabriss Bliss said. Um, in the beginning, uh, she simply changed the check- texture of the meat and, that she would eat. So she would go from chuck to ground beef. So that's the same kind of meat, but mm. it's presented in a different way. Or if you get... Um, you know, if you cook something, a ribeye, and you cook it crispy versus, um, you know, making something wet like a brisket, it's, you know, it's it's the same animal, but it's going to taste different and sort of have a different feel in the mouth. Yeah. And um, speaking of the, the actual animal itself, it, it is sometimes good to just change the animal. Like if you can afford it and you are starting to get bored or you feel stagnant, like, buy some scallops and put those with a meal and it'll feel like it'll feel like you went to a restaurant as long as you know how to cook scallops pretty okay or just yeah, scallops to... always make me feel fancy and special just it's... Like it's a special occasion when they're scallops <laughs> it's like the scallops are like no i gotta use butter um i have to make this the most delicious meal possible i don't want to drink plain water or if i do it has to go in the good glass but if i got some sparkling (laughs) water then that's what is being drank with this or if i got some tea i've been waiting on like yeah scallops makes a fancy bougie meal that could have just been something real regular before yeah i well i agree i agree scallops on a hamburger you know, now you're talking style. It's a oh, yeah. That's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Um, and um, also just even switching the room in it. Like, if you just go from beef to lamb for a little while, mm-hmm. I don't know how you get bored. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I see Carnivore Junkie was talking about something in the chat. Um, the Levitical Law Diet. Now, I have never heard of that. I've heard of the Daniel Diet. And... Um, I, you know, I, if you could just write in the chat what that is, because I am very curious about that mm-hmm. while we continue to talk about getting bored. Um, and then Seabliss had a suggestion for your dry, your dry ass brisket. <laughs> Chop it up in some <laughs> scrambled eggs and then, and cut up some trimmings. So that sounds like a good idea. That's you know, really try idea. that. I don't know if any of you saw, I had scrambled eggs and meatballs today. Hmm. So that was good. Good stuff. Yeah, I don't get I don't get bored of my food, and I make the same thing for days, maybe a week on on end, and I don't get bored. And then eventually, I do get bored of the ground beef, and I think, oh man, I'm just never going to eat this again. And then I go to eat something else. I eat the same thing for a week or so, and then there's a part of me that's like, oh man, I really miss those meatballs. 
and I have them again and I'm like, why did I stop eating meatballs? Mm -hmm. So even if I think I might get bored, it doesn't happen. So it's yeah. It, <clears throat> I also feel like the boredom might be a lack of creativity, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or if you've been told it, it could be creativity, like, oh, I'm going to do um, exactly. I'm just going to do one thing because I don't have any ideas for other things or you don't know how to cook meat. A lot of people don't know. A lot of people didn't grow up cooking meat. Um or especially like the one thing that they cooked. I know somebody mentioned earlier uh, chicken breasts in the chat. Like if that's all you've been doing, then yeah, you're going to get bored. Yeah. My Very mom quickly. used to spread um, a layer of mustard and then a layer of mayo on top of a chicken press and put it under the broiler. Mm. This is how I was fed chicken. <laughs> so is it any wonder that I hate chicken and find it disgusting? Mayonnaise on top of the chicken breast in the broiler. Like, see, that's you know, just disgusting. I could see mayonnaise working, though, because it's adding fat to the chicken. It's adding flavor. I would need more than just mustard, though. And it's still going to be chicken breast at the end of the day. And how do you broil a chicken breast? Think about how hard the external layer gets. Oh, right. As it gets all dried out. Oh. You know, and, and the, the mayo is supposed to protect that, but it's a chicken breast. And how do you even cook through a chicken breast? In the broiler. No. And then when she went on her, um, you know, vegetarian kick, she brought home a block of tofu. And so back in the old days, you get a square of uh, tofu that came in like water in one of those like crates. <laughs> and she would smear um, some mustard and smear some mayo on top and put it under the broiler. <laughs> this was the only cooking method. Yo, let me find out your mom was the mayonnaise and mustard queen. Like, yeah. that was her idea of spicing food. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> well, yeah, my mom was not um, interested in any of the, um, you know, the home economic uh, arts or any of that. She did know how to sew and to do all of that kind of stuff because she was forced to do it as a kid. And but, you know, as a, a vanguard in the women's movement, did not want to do any of those things, didn't teach me any of those things. So I had mm -hmm. to kind of learn them on my own. Um, and uh, yeah, so but I knew that chicken breast under the broiler is just not not going to work. Yeah. Right. It took yeah. me years to figure out how to do chicken breasts in a way that was decent. And the only thing I figured out was you get one of those mallets and you pound the crap out of that chicken till it's thin, like that uh -huh. size. You, you, it, it felt like I was going to break it, but never happened. And then mm -hmm. um, so you pound it out till it's thin and flat and then you fry it. Mm hmm pan fry it um because I, I never got into like breading my stuff and frying it but yeah that was a uh, that was the only way that i got chicken breast to actually come out with any sort of moisture and to taste good i mean chase you know boiled chicken would be moister and better than um the broiled so i would boil chicken over what we did i'm just imagining chicken that's like it's like black and crusty on the top and it's got yeah it's combo really hard on the top raw. yeah like you can't even yeah and then the inside's raw mm -hmm. <laughs> so you yeah. can't eat that and the outside is like chicken leather <laughs> yeah you got it that's exactly you've got the experience you know what the household was like back in uh, 1981 yeah so yeah. I think if you're trying to, if, if that's all your cooking experience, then you're going to be bored because, well, you awful. might be bored. Be, yeah. You don't know what you're doing and yeah. you got to learn like now yeah. you got to learn. Um, but it's really not tough. Like meat is, you get better at it, but I feel like making decent meat is not hard. Making really, really good meat, you know, takes time and experience and stuff, but to just be okay, like cooking some beef or some pork. It's yeah. not that rough. 
I mean, if you really don't want to put any time and effort into cooking, then I say an air fryer and making hamburgers and meatballs is like, you know, that's going to be home base for you. But it's delicious. Yeah. You know, it's not that's not a hardship to do it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, the the question I asked about the Levitical law, so Levitical law or foods that you can only eat according to the Old Testament laws. Judaism and Hebrew Israelites practice this way of eating. So that's the same thing as keeping kosher and Mm -hmm. um, like what the Orthodox do. Um, And then uh, Carver Junkie says, Dr. Axe promotes a a little bit of this, no pork or swine. It's considered unclean and shellfish and lobster. These foods are considered unclean according to the law. Um, Okay. Yeah, that's not a diet that I want to follow. No, um, I need my shellfish. Um, I was really close to buying whole lobster this weekend, but wow. I didn't. Live or? No, no, they were already probably, I don't know, however you kill a lobster and then like frozen and packaged. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I don't know if it would have, It. I guess it's not as good as if you buy it live and then cook it like right after it died. Right? Isn't that how that works? I don't know. I don't cook lobster. I think you cook them live. Oh, wait. Yeah. So are people bringing home live lobsters? I know they bring home live crabs. I've seen that. In fact, there's a yeah. hilarious video of a woman fighting with a crab to get them all in the pot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so what do you, what do you take home a live lobster in? A bag. I think they've and, got rubber bands around the, you know, the claws. The claws. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I bought t- two tails once, and I, I made them at home. Obviously, it was just the tails, so they were already dead. But I didn't know that the, <laughs> they um, they turned bright red in the boiling water. So when I got them, they were the shell was sort of brown, and I was like, gee, is this right? Mm-hmm. So it was quite a, you know, a transformation when um, I finally got them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I bought, I have bought and cooked lobster tails before, and I really feel like that's probably where I'll stay. Like whole lobster. I don't, that's a, it's a whole thing. It's kind of, it might I mean, be more than I want to get into. It's definitely an activity. One birthday I went to uh, like a crab house and they had this big platter where you got like six crabs and two lobsters and um, just, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And, uh, and, you know, I, I didn't get the, um, corn on the cob, so it was just that and butter and it mm-hmm. still took a long time to eat, you know, cause that was, it's a lot of intricate food. It takes work to get it out. And at a certain point it's like, oh, I'm sick of like fighting to get a little tiny piece of meat, you know? And so it's like, okay, I'm done. But, right. uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm in Baltimore. So crabs are a way of life here. And we had to we we moved here and had to learn how to eat crabs like yeah, very quickly. You do. Um, and my mom really got into it. And for me, I'm me and my dad are like you. We're like, we'll do a couple of them, but it's a lot of time to get not that much meat. I get bored. Yeah, yeah. So it's I mean yeah. So it, with the butter and stuff, it's nice, but um. You know, if if I'm really really hungry, it's kind of like, oh, oh my god. Yeah. You know? But so it's so good. Yeah. So when I do seafood, I have to have something else with it. Mm-hmm. I can't mm-hmm. eat just seafood. Also, it doesn't fill me up for long enough. It not doesn't not last long enough. So what I like to do, um, like all the times lately that I've had scallops, I cook those along with whatever beef I had at that time. And that makes a really good meal because oh, the beef yeah. is the substantial thing that fills you up. And the scallops like might as well be dessert. Yeah, they also have a sweet taste. But definitely, <laughs> you know, even when I've given myself the, the freedom to eat as many as I want, um, I just they don't fill me up. Yeah. You know, I don't know why. And they're so expensive that it's like hard to make this a meal. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's like. Each one is worth dollars. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Like, I, 
here in Maryland, I can't find them for anything cheaper than I think like 15 a pound. Wow. I, you know, we're, they're more than that here. Like 19, 20, Mm -hmm. 21. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a fancy meal. That's. And I'm talking about sea scallops. I do prefer sea scallops. What are the other kind? Bay scallops. Oh, I think that's always sea scallops here. Hmm. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. So surf and turf, you know, makes it tasty, yet, you know, filling. And then people put such a halo around fish that, you know, they often will let you, um, you know, let you slide and say, okay, the scallops sort of outweigh the beef. Just ridiculous, mm-hmm. but they will. People will say that it's like, oh, okay, well, you had some fish. Yeah, Almost all, like as good all as a vegetable. All fish is healthy, and you go like, well, but why? What what exactly is so healthy about fish? They have no idea. Mm-hmm. Or if they if they do, it's because fish is lower fat most of the time. Yeah, yeah. There's no other thing. It's just lower in fat. But, you know, in many ways, like, well, if it's farmed, God only knows what else is in there. Um, And if it's not, you know, there's the mercury issue or whatever else we've dumped into our oceans. So, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it's a lot going on. So, yeah, yeah, fish is it. I know people who, like, are basically vegetarian, but they eat fish. And I always wonder, like, damn, how many... uh, like you can't call yourself a vegetarian if you're eating fish. You just well, can't. definitely not. But they're like, I basically they're pescatarian. Like that's the only meat that they'll eat. And I'm thinking if that's your main source of protein and you're eating that every day, I wonder are you okay in terms of like mercury? And yeah. also if your fish are wild caught, which is better in basically most ways, are you getting plastic along with that? Because our mm-hmm. oceans are polluted. So, and, you know, what are you doing to the environment? Well, yeah, and that. There's, there's well, trade offs. Yeah. Well, why don't we transition to the next topic, which is what mm-hmm. about the earth? The other question we get from people when we say we eat carnivore, it's like, don't you care about the earth and animals? Yeah. Um, and that one is a very very complicated topic uh kind of like the the heart disease thing or just the um no specifically the heart disease and uh cholesterol like people study just this so anything that we say is just going to be a gross summary of all the information there that's actually available but i think a lot of people would be surprised to know and it's because they don't like most of us don't live on farms, never have, especially not like a uh, industrial farm to know just what happens. Um, if you really care about the environment, you would not be eating from industrial farms. And really more than just you would not be eating, you would be saying down with that entire system. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about the farms that grow plants. Mm-hmm. Um, that y- you start off with a thriving ecosystem, a prairie or a swamp or something, and you kill it. You literally kill it. You kill every animal that is was alive on that land. In that process, you have killed every living organism that was alive on that land, all the way down to the bacteria that are in the soil. Um, there's, uh, there's some statistic that there's somewhere around like 1 billion organisms per teaspoon of topsoil. Topsoil. That topsoil is the blackish stuff that you see, not the dead dirt. Like this is a, it's basically, it's a living organism, that soil. It's its own ecosystem. And you are killing all of that just so you can plant one crop, like corn or soy or cotton or whatever it is. Yeah. You've, de- you've destroyed that entire ecosystem. And then the plant that you grew has been bred to produce this product that you want, the grain, 
um, most of the time we're talking about cereal grains. So we're talking about like wheat or something like for those wheat seeds to get so big, that plant is pulling so much from the soil and it doesn't give much back because all of it goes into the seeds that we want to eat. We're going to grind those up and make bread out of them and all our other stupid foods. And then that soil is now dead and you've pulled more from it. You've pulled nutrients from it that you haven't given back to the soil. That soil, that's why you get uh, stuff like uh, the Dust Bowl back in history. Um, the ecosystem has died and there's no plans to keep that soil. So wait, when you used to say the Dust Bowl, you mean the beginning of the depression when um, yes. we had lost so much topsoil in the Midwest from all the farming that there was, you know, we weren't able, the, the crops failed. Right. Like you are creating a desert at that point. And the only way that you can still grow anything on that land is to use fertilizer. Where does that fertilizer come from? Fossil fuels. So if you're all against, you're all about the environment and you're against cars and stuff, you need to be against monocropping too. And that's what that's called. You've turned an ecosystem into a monoculture because there is only one species living in that culture, the plant that you're trying to grow. Mm -hmm. So it, that all, the, that farming system is horrible. And then I thought of another really good point that I wanted to bring up in this. And it's something that people, I think, don't think about enough. Um, we're told that animal agriculture um, causes some amount of hydrocarbons to be released into the atmosphere because cows are belching and cows are farting. So there's all this methane that's coming out of cows. That methane only lasts in the atmosphere for a certain amount of time, something like 10 years. Also, animals have existed and been belching and farting since the beginning of time, the beginning of life on this planet. So there is a methane cycle. They are not creating new methane. It's always existed. What you are doing is putting a bunch of carbon into the air by your cropping process, by your fossil fuel usage, all that stuff. But what people don't think about is by getting healthy, you are taking away your need to use the medical system. Most people who've been carnivores for a while, they're not getting sick. They're not taking prescription pills. They go to the doctor just because they're supposed to. Some of them don't. They're not in the hospitals. They're not using all those machines. They're not getting MRIs all the time and CAT scans and all that. They don't need it. The healthcare industry uses more energy than does the agriculture industry. And that's animal agriculture and vegetable agriculture, vegetable slash grain, all that stuff. So if you really want to use less, if you really want to care about the environment, then you need to get healthy and you need to eat animals, honestly. And you can even take that farther and say regenerative, um, regeneratively grown meat, which is the best. Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> no, I figured I can still hear the noises. I'm, I got quiet so I can make sure that I still heard them. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> I, you know, got a lot of video. Um, so those are all really awesome points. And, um, you know, I, the one I always kind of get interested in is the whole thing about the, um, you know, the, uh, fossil fuels and, um, mm -hmm. and the cow, you know, farts and whatnot. Cause it's like, you're, <laughs> yep. You know, I'm kind of like, it's, well, if we are to believe our own government, um, they say that, okay, here we go. Um, and it's back. Yes, I'm back. The cow farts are like 14% of, you know, the, the emissions. And then everything else is, um, hmm, wonder why I look red. It, it is a little tinted. But um, yeah, they're, they 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 came up with that fourteen percent number. They were looking at uh, I think it was total life cycle emissions for animal agriculture, but they weren't doing that for um, all the other 
industries that produce um, carbon. So when you, um, I think if they, they took it down to just exactly what the cows were farting and belching, the number went down from like 14% to either five or 2.5%. And I think it might've been a similar number for um, plant agriculture. Mm-hmm. Because they weren't doing the total life cycle for everything else. They were just looking at, so for healthcare, it might be like say all of the carbon that a hospital produces. Mm-hmm. But you're not you're not looking at the transportation that's required to keep a hospital running. Right. So there's a life cycle outside of the hospital. There's the entire medical system and all of the systems that are in place to keep that running. They weren't looking holistically at all the other industries, but they were looking holistically at animal agriculture. Mm-hmm. Once you start comparing apples to apples, the numbers look a whole lot different. But even with the numbers being what they are, you know, they're looking at like 14%, um, you know, coming from like cows and methane and the rest is like coming from, you know, planes, trains and automobiles. So if you look at that, it, you know, it makes me think like, what is the point of worrying about cows? You know, you can make a much bigger dent in the problem by addressing like the uh you know the the planes and the driving and and all of that and and not you know and eating locally i mean shipping like some of the stuff that you know we are vegetarians or vegans are instructing us to eat shipping that from you know other countries in the middle of winter is crazy you know and i now have people who are like oh i i have watermelon in february and i love it and it's like where do you think that came from? Yeah, that wasn't grown down the street. That wasn't grown even within 50 miles of you. If yeah. you have a winter, <laughs> that watermelon didn't come from anywhere near you. Yeah, yeah. And then meanwhile, like those um those acai berries, where are those from? I don't know. From it's the somewhere moon. tropical, right? Another planet. They're so <laughs> far, so far what it takes to get them here. Yeah, like... And that would be, so I I talked about regenerative. I I think there's like, there's levels to changing your eating so that you are less of a burden on the planet. Because I do believe that we need to be thinking about being good stewards of the resources that are available to us. Um, Or planet Earth, Gaia, the universe, God, whatever you want to say, like we are going to feel the pain we are going to be punished by somebody and we are we already are like it's right. too late it's already yeah. happening oh yeah yeah but i mean we could make that we could you know make that better we could stall it or we could just keep on the path that we're going mm-hmm. and it'll get worse and worse as time goes on and so i think the first part of that is you don't need to be eating plants at least with animals um it's hard to it's hard to factory farm animals the same way that you can do plants in a way that just kills everything. Um, although they'll work on it and they'll work on making some factory meat that's gonna that that lab grown stuff, the impossible burgers and all that crap. If we're calling that meat, which I don't, but yeah, that is awful. Um, I mean, and that also starts from animals. That's what I don't quite yeah. get, because you can't manufacture life. It's got to start somewhere, and then it's continued to be grown. So yeah. the cost of growing it is still way higher than just growing, it, like raising a cow. So I don't know, you know, for all the but people it's more who are ethical. pushing it. Ethical how? Like it still came from life. It's real cells that grow. So I I don't know, you know, I'm like, I, when is life like valuable when it's got a cute face or, you know, I, I don't know when it's a plant, it's not, I don't know. Yeah. So, so that, that stuff's horrible. Um, so I feel like your first step is just going to meet. And then if you, After that, you probably have two paths you can go down. And if you're really lucky, you can do both of them at the same time. You can get regenerative meat 
where regenerative is a you're growing the animals in a way that is as close as you can get to how they would have lived without human intervention. So they're moving around, they're pooping on the soil, which is providing nutrients to the ground. The grass grows better. You're getting birds and other animals that live in this now teeming ecosystem because you are, you've created a small portion of what should have existed all along. Or you can go local meat, where at least now, okay, my meat came from a factory farm or something like that. It's not perfect, but at least it's close. Mm-hmm. At least it at least it wasn't shipped from across the country to get here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you can get local, that is just a way better option and better for the earth than shipping, you know, some vegetarian stuff from Hawaii or, you know, South America or wherever. Yeah. And if you're going to eat plants, I mean, this is the Black Carnivore show, but if you if you are going to eat plants, eat them in season. Mm hmm. But, you know, even then. Uh, one of my neighbors actually was asking me um, to help her. Well, she has spearmint growing wild in her uh, front yard. And that's cool. You know, well, spearmint's a weed, so it, you know, kills everything else. So, mm. um, you know, she was earlier this summer, you know, she was like, take some. And I, I pulled some and um, it smelled so good. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. Uh, so I dried it and I've, I've just kind of had it. But, uh, you know, she recently called and was like, come back. And when I went over there, there was like way more spearmint. And she's, you know, um, elderly and, and uh, had knee replacements. So she struggles to like do this stuff. So as I was standing there, I was just kind of like, well, you know, I, I'm here, so let me just pull the weeds right now, and let me just do this real quick. But then that meant she gave me all the stuff, and I was like, oh, you know, I can't eat this now. And it smelled so aromatic and so flavorful, and, like, it mm-hmm. was like, you know, like a fresh pack of double mint gum. Um, so it was uh, definitely very tasty. But now that I think I have a problem with salicylates, which is apparently very high in the mints family, mm. I was like, <laughs> oh, thank you. Now I've got a ton of spearmint that I have nothing to do with. And you know what? Um, that brings up another funny, well, not really funny, but like really interesting point to me. I think at some point, probably in high school, um, I realized that what we call weeds and we treat them like plant pests, they're actually the native plants trying to come back to their their land, their domain that they should be on. And hmm. we're going, oh, no, I don't no, I don't want this here. I want this grass. But that grass isn't natural. That grass doesn't grow here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What does grow here is these dandelions. What does grow here is this pyramid, maybe. Mm-hmm. like whatever it is like those are the things that are supposed to be there and we in our infinite wisdom as humans say no no i want this perfectly green grass and i want only that grass like our lawns our monocultures mm-hmm. yeah yeah well not hers but that's what we're <laughs> trying to do so <clears throat> it didn't take me too long. I pulled up all the spearmint, um, ended up having to take it with me. So I don't know what to do with it because I can't drink it. Can't use it for anything. Oh, geez. What do you do like, with a I don't know of... what to do. I, could, I mean, oh. I'm seriously thinking about making soap. So uh, yes. I could make some, um, I could make some peppermint or spearmint soap. Yeah, you can put it in the soap, even though I would imagine that would still irritate you some. I mean, not for me to give away. To other oh. People. Um, Christmas. Right, right. And what if you used it just for its aromatic qualities? Would that bother you as much or at all? You mean just opening the bottle and smelling it? Uh, well, actually, yeah, they do that in hospitals. But I was thinking more so like if you found a way to turn it into a room fragrance 
Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the thing that makes it smell good is the thing. That's hmm. the salicylate. So I don't know. I mean, I imagine I can smell it and it's not really a problem or turn it into like potpourri or like, you know, like yes. a it. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I think more like what I might do is maybe just put it in a bowl and crumble it so you can sort of smell it around the, the house. And now my nose is so keen that I can actually do that. See, that works. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So I saw Siebel said Danny Vega was speaking about um, why he doesn't do ads for Butcher Box because they import their meat from New Zealand or Australia. That is wild. So, I mean, wow. That's a one far of, way to go for me. It's really far. And one of the grocery stores near me now, they've started getting Australian meat. So they'll have, um, they'll call it, uh, so it'll be grass fed. They'll market it as grass fed, but you have to read the label more clearly to see that it's Australian. Um, and it'll be cheaper than the American grain finished meat. And I'll go, the first couple times I said, oh, what the heck is that? Okay, let me try that. Like there was a, a whole tenderloin and the Australian one was like $6 a pound and the uh, American one was like eight a pound. And so I said, well, let me get the cheap one because six a pound for tenderloin like i'm gonna cut that into flaming mignons and i'm gonna eat good and then i go and actually <laughs> i go and actually cook the thing and it's tough it's not good and also i saw that it was australian and i was annoyed like why are we getting meat from all the way in australia especially if it's not even that good yeah can you yeah. imagine it takes like a day to fly from the east coast to australia yeah I, you know, I don't know. I don't understand that. I don't understand why you would want to do that from another country. You know, I mean, not that I trust, you know, our own government all that much, but God only knows what is allowed or not allowed in other countries. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, I would, I don't know. I don't really feel comfortable about that. Um, mm -hmm. And I was just, yeah. And the shipping costs. The shipping costs, the, the fossil fuels being used to bring that meat all the way over here. Yeah. Mm -mm, mm -mm. That's a horrible idea. I don't care if it's cheaper. It's only cheaper because the cost is being paid by the environment. Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so eat local. <clears throat> Buy your meat local. If you can, go to a farm and get, you know, some portion of a cow, do that. Um, you know, the, the, but that's really the better, the better option. That's what we yeah. recommend. Eat local. Yeah. Be like our, uh, <laughs> our good friend, Virginia, and just buy the whole animal. Mm hmm. Uh, well, we've never asked Janae. She's, uh, you know, whole life for you. <clears throat> she has been eating regenerative and feeding her family that for a long time and found tremendous healing. So, um, you know, then she goes to local farms to get it. So I don't know if she's bought a, like a whole cow at once. Um, but you know, that's definitely something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Or even if you don't have the space for that, like a quarter cow will fill up a residential freezer. Like the, the kind that goes just above the, the kind that sits above your refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. Nice. Um, okay, so our last uh, question is, what about vitamins? Where do you get your vitamins? Like, how are you not <laughs> malnourished? So, what would say to you to that? Uh, oh, this vitamin one I've C gotten. is the first one that you know people think of to ask. I specifically remember the last time I was asked that. I told somebody, um, it's always interesting. So. Um, yeah, being single and being carnivore is very interesting because you tell that person, like, at some point you got to have this conversation. And it's weird because it can feel like coming out, like, to your family. Like, you got to, I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but 
I only eat meat. And you just wait for their reaction. So this person was like, what? What do you, what do you mean? And I was like, exactly. Like, I, I thought I said it clearly. I'm a carnivore. The vast majority, most of what I eat, damn near all of what I eat is meat. And one of the questions was, well, what do you do about, how do you get vitamins? Like, how do you get all the, the stuff you're supposed to get? And we have this idea, like we have lionized plants, we have canonized plants and said that plants are the only, they're the major source of all these things. Like how many people can probably quote to you two or three vitamins at least that spinach is supposed to be super high in? I and know, I guess that stupid cartoon. Right. Yeah. Like I. So we didn't eat a ton of spinach when I was growing up. But then like I got grown and started cooking my own food. And it was um, it was like, oh, spinach on everything. Like I discovered uh-huh. spinach and I was putting spinach in my scrambled eggs. And I thought I was really doing something for myself. And I was putting spinach on my set. Um, I was making salads out of just spinach and uh, the, what else was I doing? I can't remember the others, but I found ways to incorporate spinach in just about everything. And I really thought I was doing it. I'm like, oh, dude, this is high in calcium. And I think vitamin A is supposedly in spinach. Uh, I don't know what else, maybe vitamin K or something, but like and then I had a coworker who had a, she was growing Swiss chard. So she would give me Swiss chard and I would eat that. And I didn't like it, but vegetables aren't supposed to taste good. They're supposed to be good for you. Yeah, and, absolutely. Oh, little did I, mean, I know. You know, I, every, I feel like every decade, every vegetable gets its, it, you know, it's time. And so <laughs> in the sixties and the seventies, it was like raisins and carrots. And then um, in the 80s, it was broccoli. And in the 90s, it was garlic. And um, and then in the 2000s, it was uh, uh, kale and avocado. So, you know, every vegetable and oh, and garlic was somewhere in there. Um, so every vegetable like gets its heyday. And each one, you know, I dutifully went through and tried to eat them, um, you know, religiously. And it just you know, it was so hard. It like really upset my stomach. Kale specifically just did a number on my stomach until finally I said, this is, this might be the best thing in the world to eat, but I I can't handle this amount of bathroom time. So I just, it's just not something I'm going to eat. Yeah. Um, I was doing the, somebody, Seabliss mentioned green smoothies. I was doing those all the time. Mm -hmm. I, was eating more fruit than I ever had before. I really thought I was doing something. And this is a perfect time to point people to, and it's actually free online. Um, There's uh, in the Carnivore Cookbook, but if you just go to the Carnivore Cookbook website or whatever Craig and Maria Emmerich have for their website, um, they post, they have some of their charts from the book, just free online. And one of them is, the breakdown of what's in like, I think it's like kale versus steak versus beef liver. Yeah. And the difference is almost like maddening when you realize that steak, just meat is denser, not just like a little bit denser, not like 10% denser, like in a lot of, a lot of those categories of like the certain the different vitamins and minerals and stuff, it's like 10 times more dense. Yeah. And And at such small amounts, you know, three ounces of meat is a tiny amount, but three ounces of vegetables, like, you know, with the amount of meat that you're actually going to eat in a day, you know, like a pound, a pound and a half, you're getting way all of the vegetables, all of the RDA. So yeah, you know, you don't have to worry about whether you're going to get any of these vitamins. You're getting all of them to, you know, the maximum amount that you need. 
But with vegetables, you know, you're getting like one thing for each one and you've got to collect them all and eat a variety of them in order to make sure that you get everything. So the yep. idea that we need variety in our food is kind of like a starvation, um, you know, approach where you're trying to eat a lot of things. So you together get one whole meal, but you don't have to do that when you're eating animal foods. Um, yeah. And, and that was one of the things that I found really um, kind of maddening as like, I talked before about, um, well, just now about like, all of a sudden, like, I'm on my own, I'm grown, and I'm mm -hmm. trying to be like the most, the best adult that ever adulted. So I got to eat nutritious food. So eating all these vegetables. And I'm just Googling stuff and learning that, oh, well, cinnamon is supposed to lower your blood pressure. So now I make sure that my oatmeal every morning has cinnamon on it. Like I already like cinnamon in the oatmeal, but now it's the thing that I need to do because it's good for your blood pressure and got to keep the blood pressure low. Don't have no idea what my blood pressure is at this point, but I just know it needs to be low. So I'm <laughs> eating cinnamon on stuff. And Damn, I forgot where I was going. <laughs> well, you instead I was on a roll. <laughs> you become obsessed with your cinnamon and with your herbs and spices oh. that you think are healthy. Right. Okay. And when you look at the vegetables, like you said, so each vegetable only does like one or two things. Mm -hmm. If before yeah. you even know that meat is denser, you just know like, all right, so spinach for this. But then you, if you actually look at it, you say, well, I got to eat this whole bag of spinach just to get one RDA of whatever thing I'm trying to get. Mm -hmm. And, but I also have like 40 other nutrients that I'm supposed to be thinking about apparently every day. Mm -hmm. And if you have any, uh, I feel like you very quickly will realize that this does not work. No one can eat this way. I can't have a day of doing this math in my head. Did I have enough spinach today? Okay, uh, okay, I'm good on that. So I'm good on these these two nutrients. Mm -hmm. And okay, well, spinach doesn't do this though. I have to have garlic for that. Did I did I have enough garlic? No, I didn't. I gotta like you would end up with a spreadsheet as your diet. Mm -hmm. Which we all did. Like I used to track my diet in fit. Um, well, you know, my fitness pal and others of those things. And, you know, I was always trying to like juggle this stuff. So I was getting a hundred percent of everything, which means that, you know, I have to eat weird combinations of foods in order to make sure that happens. Yeah. And no one can realistically long-term live that way. Yeah. You're not going to do it. You're going to try it for a while. You're going to look at your numbers. Like I was doing, um, so I had my fit, my fitness pal and I would put all the food that I ate in there, all this supposedly healthy stuff. And my fitness pal will end up at the end of the day, give you this really, what I thought was helpful, like summary of your day. Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh, I'm low on like all the vitamins. Mm-hmm because I wasn't eating a lot of meat because meat wasn't good for you. Right. So I'm like, oh, I'm screwed. Or I got to, I, I don't know what I can do. Yeah. And I didn't go the route of trying to add more and more vegetables. I just, I think I kind of intrinsically realized that this doesn't work. So, so I gave up did you trying to get decide, all the vitamins. So did you just go the other route of saying, okay, well, I'll take a multivitamin. Central, uh, one a day. Right. You get you a hundred percent of your RDA. That's what it says. I think on I the was. Bottle. I think I was taking at some point. I was taking vitamin C because my dad was a huge proponent of vitamin C. So I was taking that and a multivitamin. Um, yeah, yeah, I was because um, Aldi has uh, gummy multivitamins that actually taste good. So yeah, I was pounding Candy those. Candy for breakfast. Like, and to get your vitamins. Exactly. I'd eat like two of those a day. Nice. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. 
and that's that's the other thought. That's the other way people go. Either you got this spreadsheet and you're trying to get all the vegetables that you possibly can to get up to these high RDAs because these vegetables actually don't have enough of the stuff that they're supposedly high in. Or you load yourself down with vitamins, which are just as not bioavailable as a lot of the nutrients that are in uh, the vegetables. Well, bioavailability, I think, is a really important point. And Carnivore Junkie uh, wrote, I tell people to do the poop test. Your veggies, especially corn, usually come out the other end in the same form. So we don't extract the vitamins and proteins that the plants contain, but cows do. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know that when I would eat a lot of spinach, I would find that um, my waist would also come out dark green which I was kind of like, that seems weird mm-hmm. and not good. Um, but that's what I would notice. Yeah. And apparently Dr. Sevy has been telling people to go for sea moss. So I don't know why, um, but that's the new thing. I mean, that was popular in Jamaica and there's like some drink where people uh, drink it, but yeah. Yuck. Sea moss. Mm-hmm. So carnivore junkie says sea moss is inferior to ribeye. I, I would agree. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say that nothing green is superior to ribeye. <laughs> but um, the carnivore mystic <laughs> says it was helpful in healing her gut lining along with bone broth and mineral water. So, um, so if anybody is struggling with that, you know, it's something to consider. Yeah. Um, but I, sea moss. I would go with the bone broth and the mineral water first and see, you know, where you go, where you go with that. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you definitely, you want to do your best to try to resolve the gut problems. Cause that that's tough. Yeah. It's a that's huge tough. deal. Um, a carnivore junkie says, um, I believe it's the gel like formation that helps with leaky gut. It creates a protective barrier. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So then that would mean that you just need it until your body can form the barrier that it's supposed to have on its own. Yeah. Assuming yeah. it doesn't create inflammation as it's creating a barrier. Right. And that's the, so I don't have a, we've talked about this before. Um, I don't have a problem with plants as medicine. Mm-hmm. You have you have an acute issue. You take a plant for some time and you use it to um, help you heal that condition. Sure. Yeah. Um, I would not be telling anybody long term. Oh yeah, eat, eat sea moss every, every, every day. Eat sea moss. So Chase LeBeau is asking, how would I eat at a restaurant like Fogo de Chao without getting sick? Uh, why would you get sick? Because so often at restaurants, you know, you don't really know what they're doing. I mean, really there, they're grilling. So um, I think that they do, I, I feel like I've seen them wipe down the meat with like oil or something to keep it moist. Mm-hmm. So that would be bad. Um, but other than that, I don't know. I would think it's okay. Yeah, that or would the be problem the... is would be with you're trying to get your your money's worth, and you know perhaps overeating. I could see that. Um, the last time, well, I'd say the last time, the only time I was there, my issue was they kept bringing the pork around. Mm. They kept bring the stupid old pork and chicken. They kept bringing that, and they weren't giving me enough of the actual beef. Um, that annoyed me. And I could imagine eating too much of the pork or chicken would make me feel a little sick. Yeah. Um, June Plum Kid says, talking about vitamins, my doctor told me I needed B12 because I had been having numb fingers and and lips. I had been eating poorly for the past several months, strict meat now, and numbness is gone. So that's great. Congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah. Isn't numbness uh, usually magnesium? I don't know. It could also be B12, I guess. Mm. It's a neural neurological problem. Okay. Um, so, yeah. I I think um I don't know where you were going to go, but I realized that we we're kind of off the topic of vitamins and just into how plants 
don't have the vitamins that people think they do. Mm -hmm. um, what we should say, well, we no, we talked about density. We said that meat has everything. We I brought up the chart. Um, oh, vitamin C. Meat does not have a lot of vitamin C. Meat does have some vitamin C, though. And there's some evidence, I can't really say it's conclusive, but there is evidence that says that um, if you are eating a low carb diet, you need much less vitamin C than a person on a high carb diet because sugar and vitamin C compete for the same, um, I forget what exactly what it's called now, but the pathway. Yes, yes, the pathway. So if you don't have a lot of sugar in your system, then the little vitamin D that you are getting from meat, and especially if you're eating liver, because liver is higher in vitamin C than just muscle mm -hmm. meat, um, it is going to get in your system and be used by the body more readily because there is less sugar competing with it for that pathway. Yeah. And they say, too, that part of what vitamin C is doing in the case of scurvy is helping, you know, your body's using it to create collagen. But if you're eating a lot of collagen, which is mm. what happens when you're eating meat, you don't, you know, you don't need as much vitamin C because your body can take what you're eating and use that as collagen. So, um, you know, so I thought that was really interesting. And, you know, they called um, the British sailors limeys because they would bring limes with them to prevent scurvy. Oh. But, yeah. But, um, you know, all the places like in the north and, um, you know, along the Arctic, like all these other people were like, you, you don't need that. You just need fresh meat. That's how you, you know, that's how you prevent scurvy. You just need fresh meat. And there's enough of, you know, vitamin C and collagen in the fresh meat that takes care of your, your needs. So, um, you know, so I, you know, that's something they needed to think about with vitamin C. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's kind of, I don't know. I think that's kind of it. Yeah. So yeah. then, if all those people on those ships, if they just knew how to fish while they were in the ocean, they'd be fine. Like, uh, yeah. it would be a very different kind of expedition, but they probably, they could have been okay if they actually had access to fresh meat the whole time. And you're on the ocean, it's full of fish, you just got to know how to get them. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I don't know. And that's not how, you know, and, and like... That's just not how they operate um, these kind uh, of ships. Like, I, you know, they were racing across the Atlantic with their full ships and not looking to feed anybody and not looking to stop or slow down. They were delivering slaves or doing whatever they were doing. So, yeah. 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 Is, what, I, what I'm proposing, I understand, is a very different probably totally impractical for their purposes, uh, mm -hmm. strategy. Yeah. But I do think it would work and it'd be more fun. Got to yeah. eat yeah. fresh fish and you're in the ocean. So those fish, um, that water is cold. So those fish have more fat. So they probably, they taste better. Presumably. Yeah. So that might be, but, you know, I never understood why there was all this debate about whether meat has vitamin C or not. I, I always thought, well, you know, why are we talking about this? Like, why can't we just test it? Like, how much does it cost to test a piece of meat? I'll pay the $50. I'm tired of like, there being this debate over how to get vitamin C. It's just like, test it and see, then you'll yeah. know. That's all you just know. So I, mean, I don't know. It sounds really simple. Yeah. I'm like, I, you know, I don't understand. Um, and then let's see, Romia asks, how important is vitamin K and does meat provide enough? And Carnivore Junkie says beef liver, pork chops, and chicken are high in sources of vitamin K. And I thought okay. um, perhaps um, uh, like egg yolks and um, I don't know, fish, does that also have a lot of vitamin K? I don't know about fish. I would imagine that any um, any whole animal that you eat, 
is going to have more of it. So it makes perfect sense that liver would have more. It makes perfect sense because liver is a nose to tail kind of thing, as opposed mm-hmm. to just getting muscle meat. Um, mm-hmm. And it makes really a lot of sense that eggs would for that reason, too, because that is a whole animal. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I guess... So for the first question, how important is vitamin K? It's a vitamin. It's extremely important. We cannot live without it. Um, Does meat provide enough? Without researching it, I'm still just going to say yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I mean, you don't often hear people walking around with a deficiency of vitamin K. And considering how poorly we eat, you would think that would happen if it were hard to get if it were not in a lot of different types of foods. Right. So that makes me think that actually um, it's uh, it's not one of the vitamins that we need a ton of. Mm -hmm. That it's actually pretty easy to get enough of it. Yeah, that's what carnivore junkie says. It's rare to be deficient in vitamin K unless you're starving and you'll be fine just getting it from meat. Yeah. And that's one of the other things um, that I I tell people and it probably sounds really like flip or curt when I say it, but um, meat has everything we need. Mm -hmm. So I don't really, I don't even, when I'm being questioned about my carnivore diet, I don't like answering specific questions about like, well, how do you get this? Well, spinach is really high in this. How do you get that? Because like, no, I don't remember exactly how much, how many milligrams of vitamin D um, three ounces of beef has. No, I don't know. I know that it's more than what you're going to find in any plant source. I also know that it's available as opposed to being in the plant where one, um, plants operate on a different like biological strategy than we do. So Mm -hmm. the form that they have most of these vitamins in is not in the way that we use them. So Mm -hmm. our bodies, like uh, beta carotene is one uh, that's in carrots. Like we, our body has to transform that into the vitamin that we can use. It doesn't start off that way. We don't just take what the carrot has. Same with oil and flaxseed, right? Like we try to say that's omega-3, but it's not. It's got to be. Yeah, it's a precursor Mm -hmm. to omega-3. I don't know. I couldn't tell you what the fatty acids are, but yeah, it's one of those. It's another one of those things that the plant doesn't have it in the way that we use. You know what does? Things from the animal kingdom. Yeah. So it's kind of the answer to every question ends up being meat has it. Meat has it. Oh, well, what about meat has it? You didn't even let me finish the meat has it. Meat has it all. Yeah. We lived on meat. We lived on meat before we started growing plants. It has everything that we need. Those animals are closer to our structure than those plants are that you're eating. Yeah. So June Plum Kid says, um, I bought some uh, Irish moss to try in a smoothie and just couldn't do it. So I put it in my hair, laughing out loud. <laughs> how, how bad did it taste? Or wh- why couldn't you do it? I'm very curious. Um, I've seen in the Jamaican places near me, like I've seen, you know, they have the Irish moss, but usually, you know, people are ordering the sorrel or the ginger beer. That's what I'd be getting. So, you know, I was never getting that Irish moss stuff, but I saw it and somebody must have been <laughs> ordering it because they made it. So there you go. Uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking of what I would want from a like Jamaican grocery store. Probably curry. Jerk chicken and... or jerk anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Brown like if they're selling chicken. If they're selling cooked food, then yeah, I'm gonna want those things. But I'm thinking oh. if they're just selling the the precursors to the food. Oh well, the curry spice, yeah. Yeah. All the spices. Definitely not Irish moss. I um, wonder what moss even tastes like. I think it tastes just like what you imagine it would taste like. 
That's not very good. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> she said she didn't like the way it looked. <laughs> yeah. I, I hear you. I, you know, I can appreciate that. It would be really tough for me. Um, so there you go. We covered a lot of the common questions that we get, you know, you know when people start to talk about uh, this diet. So I encourage you to kind of start thinking about the questions you know are coming, that you know you're going to have to deal with with your family. Thanksgiving is, you know, a month away and, uh, and Christmas right. thereafter. So we're, we're going to be in that season of explaining ourselves or getting knocked off our diet and deciding we don't want to stand out. So we'll just eat that thing that's going by, but you have to decide, you know, how you want to feel and how good you want to feel because, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunities to get knocked off. Um, so we are here to be your support to, um, to bounce off of, and for you to, to know that there are people who are sticking to it. I'm not going off my, my program. I'm not going off my plan at all. So you can know that there are some of us who, you know, are right there with you. Well, I might eat smoked brisket, but I, I'm certainly not eating a cake. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> yeah. And I do think it helps to... Um think about those conversations beforehand. Sorry. Jeez, your, your <laughs> yawn hit me, but it was like late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I, for me, it actually helps to kind of rehearse those conversations. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what's going to happen. You know how your family is or how your friends are or whoever um, th you're going to have this conversation with. And think about what they're going to say. Think about what's important to them and try to be ready. Because I don't know if you're like me, but I hate being caught off guard. I hate getting asked questions that I had no idea were, were coming. So I wasn't prepared at all. That's not fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely, uh, you know, getting myself ready and, um, and a little bit more prepared. Because, you know, I might have the long answer, but it's so long that no one wants to hear it. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard to get the short answer. I think what I'm really going to try to do is create like some Instagram posts or, you know, some graphics that just kind of, you know, hit each one of these, whew, sorry, each one of these issues. My God, mm. I am tired. Mm. Um, so <laughs> yeah. And carnivore mystic says, tell them to mind their business. I, yeah, that's another, there's option. also that. Yeah. Yeah, that is always an option. And I think it should always be OK to just. Just eat how you feel like eating mm -hmm. um, like this is what I'm doing. I'm not judging you. I'm not making any comment about what you're doing, but I'm going to eat this and I don't want that. There's really nothing else to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, all right, so we went through our five questions. We're coming up on the end. Um, Arian inspired me to save some of my tallow and um, prepare to make soap. So I'm going to do that. Nice. Um, yeah. And um, so having edibles in the bathroom is, um, you know, a little surprising. And I, I also have been using tallow on my skin, and that has been going great. And um, then my dog went in and tried to eat that um, in the bathroom. So, yeah, I was kind of like, oh, food in the bathroom. See, this is why it's a problem. It attracts okay. people. So what are we talking about? You had <laughs> tallow that I use on my skin, but it's very good tallow. It tastes good. And my dog went after it. She right. somehow managed to turn a lid of a jam jar and open it and get inside so wow. yeah i don't know how so, that happened but it did we need we need to make sure that's clear she's talking about tallow was in the bathroom that was the edible it was tallow yes, yes. yeah Just wanted so to make and sure that I'm was clear making, right and if i'm making soap i you know i fear that my 
you know, dog might decide, oh, this tastes like dinner, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. So, but if I put so your dog ate all the it, tallow. No, she didn't eat it all. Oh my god, I'd be so upset if that happened. No, she didn't. Mm. I heard it. I heard the the lid clatter into the tub, and then I called her, and she came running in and said nothing. <laughs> it's like, oh, now I know you were really doing something. Gives you that look like what? What? Mm-hmm. What do you mean? What? I, I wasn't doing nothing. Yeah, I was right here. What are you talking about? Oh, your nails look really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Have you been losing weight? Oh my God, your skin is glowing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right, Nasaya says, I think I have a hard time having these conversations conversations because I don't believe myself. I've fallen off so many times. How can I explain to someone else? Yeah, um, I totally get it. I, I feel like I, I know that feeling. Um it's why I don't like talking about things a lot of times until I'm sure about them for myself. So I would just say, probably try to have that conversation as little as possible until you feel good with what you're doing and you feel stable in it. And I guess if you're forced to, um, I don't know, like one of those weird situations where like, social pressure is kind of forcing you to talk about it, but you really don't want to. You, maybe you need an exit strategy. Well, you know, a lot of what I did in the early days was just um, to deflect. So, you know, you can tell when someone's getting ready to ask you a question about what you're eating or your body or your weight, you know, because you can see them looking at your body. You can see them looking at your plate. So, you know, that's when I would have a couple of uh, sentences ready to, you know, to deflect. So, um, you know, what, uh, like, I love your blouse. Where'd you get it? Um, your hair looks great. You know, looks, is it a different color? Did you dye it? Or I don't know, whatever seems appropriate. <laughs> but, you know, have these sentences already written out and ready and um, ready to go so that you can, you know, do that and deflect the uh, conversation and keep it moving. So that can be a great strategy. Yeah. And you know what? That reminds me too. A lot of times I feel like I am too, I'm expecting the conversation to go way deeper than it actually goes. Mm -hmm. I've got all these answers ready or I'm like, oh geez, okay, here we go. We're having a carnivore talk. So sure. Mm hmm Bring, come at me and I'm ready. And actually all they wanted to do was, you don't eat bread? And all I, all I needed to say was, no, I don't want any bread. And they go, oh, okay. And they move on. They're off to another thing. They don't actually care. Yeah. It's there is me. That. I've been making it this big thing. And for me it is because it's all about my health and all that. But like all that's personal. As far as what they wanted, they're just like, like I was literally at, um, I was at a party, a uh, housewarming, maybe like uh, however long ago, doesn't matter. But I had a plate that was just a hamburger. And the host walks by me and she says, are you good? Did, you know there's buns over there. And I go, yeah, I'm fine. Why don't you have a bun? I didn't want one. You're not eating bread? No. And she moved on. Mm -hmm. I didn't need to explain why I was eating bread. She didn't care. She just wanted to make sure that I was okay. She was just trying to be a good host. But in my head, I was ready for having to defend why I'm not eating bread. Mm -hmm. um, Carnivore <laughs> Mystic suggests there's a book called The Gentle Art of Verbal Self-Defense. I love that. I love that idea. I'm immediately going to look for that on Amazon. That sounds good. Yeah, that sounds great. So I think everyone should, uh, well, don't order it before me, so <laughs> it doesn't sell out. But yeah, I think that's really good. And yeah, and also Carnivore Mystic says, um, well, we can have shame. We have shame because it's so personal and different. Just be confident in your decision and people will usually leave you alone. 
But I find, yeah. yeah, when you, when people ask you a question and you say no firmly, then there's no further discussion. But if you're like, uh, no, then that's when opens, uh, you know, the gates to try to convince you or, you know, whatever. But if you say no firmly, you know, it's just like, okay, you mm -hmm. know, and people just move on and they're not interested. So, uh, yeah, I definitely think you got to be firm in your speech. Even if you're not firm in your head yet, being firm in your speech will make you firm in your head. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a big difference. That's that's why I really liked um, Deb's idea of if you're at a restaurant or something, just tell people, oh, I'm, I'm diabetic. I'm allergic to grains. Yeah. It's not real, but it's so firm, no one questions it. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I hate to do that, but I, I do for, um, you know, I, I don't like to lie or mistake, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's like you kind of got to do that in order to make sure that you're not, you're getting what you need. Yeah. And I think that there's just times where the amount of work that you can put into a situation, the amount of energy that you can put into it is not worth what your goal is. Mm -hmm. Like in in those three minute conversations, does it really matter if that person understands that you're a carnivore and you did this for health and all this stuff that we explained through this whole show? Or do they just need to know that I'm not eating that thing? Mm -hmm. probably the latter <laughs> yeah and if they're the host they might just be like trying to make sure that you have everything you need yeah in which case you say yes this is what yep. i wanted this is exactly what i wanted yeah now june plum brought up earlier grandma and her pie um that's going to be a conversation i don't know how you're getting out of that well, if she's 99 and got up for the first time in years to make this pie, then I think you're going to have to eat it. <laughs> that's, but, that's what I would do. But if she's been making the pie for a long time, you had it last year, you had it at Easter, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe you don't need to eat the pie. Maybe, Maybe you need to give grandma a big hug and just say, how are you doing? Tell me. <laughs> or or maybe there's a... A spatial self-defense where you just you sit away from grandma so that she doesn't see your plate doesn't have pie. Um, Melissa says, I'd feel weird speaking that over myself, even if I know the chances of actually getting it is minimal on this way of eating. Yeah, I, get I mean, that. I get it. I, you know, maybe maybe that's a little bit of my feeling, but um, I, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I, maybe it's superstitious, but I just, I don't like the idea of speaking certain things on folks and including myself. Like, I don't like the, like, just wishing somebody would die. I never do that. I hate it. Um, telling people to kill themselves, like, as a joke, You're I don't do that. You've gone through life with uh, a very blessed life without many enemies. Oh, without wishing death on them? Well, I mean, without enemies worth, there are definitely enemies worth wishing death on. Um, but I'm just saying you're, you're lucky to not have come across that many of them. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's been a small list. Um, and that's also just kind of my personality. I'm not a hateful, scornful, hold a grudge person. But um, yeah, I really, I probably wouldn't want to do it. Maybe not for that reason, because it's so ridiculous. I wouldn't feel like I'm speaking diabetes on myself or I'm speaking allergy onto myself, but I get it. I get it completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, carnivore mystic says, just say I'm full when it's time for pie. And then if they give it to you after, like go ahead and take it home mm -hmm. and toss it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No one but, has to know, know that you throw it away, but you. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, the other thing, too, to remember is that people, you know, they don't really pay that much attention to what we do, but mm -hmm. they like to be paid attention, too. So when you start asking questions, um, you know, of a person or 
complimenting them, you know, you're putting the attention back on them, which is where most people are comfortable, <laughs> where the attention is on themselves. So, um, you know, so I, that was the method that I used to really to deflect. And so even when there were circumstances where I felt like I was kind of guilted into, um, you know, eating something, I still, I still did that, you know, and I still like the, gave the person, you know, my personal attention rather than the food attention so that they would feel, you know, loved and, and, um, valued beyond just the food. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Um, Think of it as acting, not lying. It's an art, not deception. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's definitely true. I definitely, I feel like there's telling the truth and then there's just, I don't know, being dumb and telling all your business. Yeah. Well, it's not lying so, so much as, you know, yeah, I think it's more what Arian said, like, just, I don't want to, I don't want to create that reality by saying it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, and there's other ways to get out of those situations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, so we have covered a lot of information here, and clearly, Arian and I are fading a little bit because it has it has been a while. We have been on this um, this topic for a long time. I really enjoyed it. Thank you all for staying, um, and uh, I really appreciate it. And um, you know, let's have a great evening. Now, tomorrow, Wednesday night um, at 6.30, I am going to premiere the interview with Judy, uh, Nutrition with Judy. So I'll be on the, li the live chat. So if you want to watch it then and comment or ask questions, you know, feel free. And then I'm going to do the Zoom meeting right afterwards at 7.30. So, um, you know, I'll see you, to see whoever then. And, you know, the conversation can continue. And, um, you know, and that's it. And uh, we're, we're going to have a great time. And then Thursday, we're back and we are, I don't know exactly what we're talking about yet, but we will put it out there and you will know as soon as we know. Right. It'll be something. Yeah. It'll be awesome. Um, <laughs> okay, everybody. So have a great night. Good night. And we will see you soon. Good night, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye.